Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we meet again on my lecture seven for CHM four seven seven. In my lecture six, I was telling you about the linear combination of atomic orbitals (LCAO), uh, where I did a quick revision on. Uh, Revision on Aubert principle, electron configuration of atoms. Um, then I went on to describe how the atomic orbitals of two hydrogen atoms combine to make uh, this molecular orbital, the sigma 1s molecular orbital, sigma antibonding 1s molecular orbital, what their shapes are, and uh, how. Uh, the two uh, place in terms of energy where the sigma bonding orbital molecular orbital is lower in energy or more stable than the sigma antibonding molecular orbital and the two are uh, the, the product of constructive interference and destructive interference of the two atomic orbitals in forming the bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals respectively. So I would like to then um, continue the lecture on telling you the properties of the resultant molecular orbitals that are important for you to note in terms of size and the shape. And the shape actually describes uh, the electron distribution that is probable for that particular molecular orbital as well as the energy. There are several important points that you must notice. The first one is the electron probability of both molecular orbitals is centered along the line passing through two nuclei. What does it mean? Now have a look at this. This is your bonding molecular orbital. This is your antibonding molecular orbital. The concentration of electron is between the two nuclei of hydrogen. Say so even in the bonding, you have the concentration of electrons along the line of between one hydrogen to another, similarly with the antibonding. Okay. For the sigma bonding molecular orbital or sigma 1s, the greatest electron probability is between the nuclei, whereas for the sigma antibonding molecular or orbital, it is on either side of the nuclei. The term sigma is given because the 1s atomic orbitals overlap head on or head to head overlap. So, yeah. For the bonding molecular orbital, you have more electrons between the two nuclei. For, uh, for the antibonding molecular orbitals, you get more electrons outside of the space between the two nuclei. Now, number two that we must notice about these molecular orbitals is in the molecule, only molecular orbitals are available, available for occupation by electrons. The 1s atomic orbital or the of the hydrogen atom, this is not or, this should be of, of the hydrogen atoms no longer exists because the hydrogen the hydrogen molecule, which is a new entity, has its own set of new orbitals. So you do not fill in electrons anymore at this 1s electrons of the atomic uh, hydrogen. We now fill in the uh, electrons in the molecular orbital in the middle. These two do not exist anymore when the molecule is uh, formed. Number three, the sigma bonding molecular orbital is lower in energy than the 1s orbital of the free atom. Yeah. The sigma bonding is lower in energy than the 1s of the atom, while the sigma antibonding is higher. Yeah, it is higher up in here. It is higher. This is your sigma antibonding is higher. 
This implies that hydrogen molecule is more stable than two separate hydrogen atoms since both the electrons occupy the lower energy sigma 1s. Yeah, if you look at the electron position in the atom, both the electrons are on higher energy level here and there. But when the molecules, the molecule is formed, both these electrons occupy the lower energy level and lower energy level means they are more stable. This situation favors the formation of the molecule, which is pro-bonding, i.e. the driving force behind the formation of the molecule, which provides a molecular orbital at a lower energy level than the atomic orbitals the electrons occupy in separate atom. This is why hydrogen molecule is more stable than separate hydro hydrogen atoms by 432 kilojoule per mole. It is a lot more stable for hydrogen to exist as diatomic molecule uh, compared to monoatomic atom, okay? Number four, if electrons are forced to occupy the antibonding molecular orbital, they will have a higher energy or less stable than in the atomic orbital. This situation will favor the separated atom, hence the name antibonding. We will see this example later. We don't see it here in hydrogen because hydrogen only has two electrons to deal with. But if um, uh, there is the third electron, it will have to occupy this position. And putting electrons in the antibonding molecular orbital will weaken that bond. Yeah, because antibonding is, by the name, not for bonding. It is against the bonding. Number five. Electrons occupying the bonding molecular orbitals strengthen or stabilizes the bonds in the molecules, whereas electrons occupying the antibonding molecular orbital weakens or destabilizes the molecular bond. This will become very apparent when we calculate the bond order. I'm going to, I don't know whether you have learned about bond order. We're going to discuss bond order later and then a higher bond order means a more stable molecule, a stronger bond. A lower bond order means a, a less stable and less strong uh, bonding. We will talk about um, bond order of the bond later. And number six, the labels <coughs> on the molecular orbitals indicate their symmetry, which is the shape the parent atomic orbitals, and whether they are bonding or antibonding. So there are three in big information that you can uh, gather from the, sig uh, from the symbol of the molecular orbital. Antibonding character is indicated by an asterisk. So for hydrogen molecule, both molecular orbitals have sigma symmetry and both are constructed from each hydrogen 1s atomic orbital. That means this sigma indicate the shape of the molecular orbital. Sigma um, bonds are formed through the head-to-head -head coll uh, collision or head-to-head -head overlap of the atomic orbital. And the shape is uh, the electrons are concentrated along the line between the two nuclei. Now, 1s indicate the parent atomic orbital. The atomic orbital comes from the 1s, so this is sigma 1s. And if you have an asterisk here, it indicates the antibonding nature of the molecular orbital. Without the asterisk, it indicates that it is a bonding molecular orbital. Now, number seven. Molecular orbital configuration can be written in much the same way as atomic configurations. Since the hydrogen molecule has two electrons in the sigma 1s molecular orbital, then the electron configuration is sigma 1s2. Two um, superscript, that means there are two electrons occupying that molecular orbital. 
And number eight, the number of molecular orbitals will always be the same as the total number of atomic orbitals used to construct them. The number of orbital is conserved. So in here you look at this. You have one atomic orbital, two atomic orbital. The combination of these two atomic orbitals will give you two molecular orbitals. One at the bottom as the bonding and one at the top as the anti-bonding molecular orbital. So number nine, electrons will fill up the molecular orbitals with the lowest energy level first, singly, and then doubly opposite sign. So if they have to uh, um, pair up in one molecular orbital, one electron will have a sign up like that, and uh, uh, spinning that away, and then another electrons will come in and the opposite sign, so they have opposite sign. If uh, the next electron will then occupy the next higher energy level molecular orbitals, if the molecular orbitals are degenerate, degenerate means they have the same energy level, they will have, they will have to fill in the uh, orbital singly first until all the degenerate MOs are singly occupied and they will fill then, th they will fill the uh, orbitals doubly once they're all singly occupied. Follow the, the same Hans rule. Yeah. And number 10, the number of electrons filling up the molecular orbitals is the same as the total number of electrons from the atomic, parent atomic orbitals. Have a look at this one. One electron from this hydrogen at the, on the left, one electron from that hydrogen on the right, two electrons all together, and the two electrons will fill in the uh, molecular orbital, lower energy first, and then when there is more to fill, they go to the top. So that is, there are ten, that those are the 10 things that we need to understand about molecular orbital. Most of them, they are... Um, following the same old rule as before, okay? Uh, the types of molecular orbital, we have the sigma bonding uh, molecular orbital through the head-to-head -head overlap. You have the pi bonding molecular orbital through the side-to-side -side overlap. And we also have the delta uh, um, molecular orbital. Uh, that will be produced when you have d orbitals overlapping. Yeah. Um, sigma is when you have head to head overlap. Here you have an example of that interaction. The positive in, uh, the the in, uh, positive interaction give you bonding. This is you've seen it before, or something is um, is missing. Oh yeah. Sorry about that. Constructive interaction give you sigma bonding, destructive give you sigma antibonding like before. The symbol sigma is used because sigma is the letter S in the Greek alphabet and a sigma molecular orbital is analogous to an atomic S orbital, although it need not be formed from S orbitals. Okay, we have pi pi molecular orbitals when you have the z orbitals overlapping side to side or the uh, pz orbital or the py orbital are overlap overlapping side to side yeah now a pi molecular orbital can be formed by the overlap of two suitably orientated p orbitals in a simple case of diatomic molecule or any other linear molecule Pi orbitals always come in pairs because there are always two similar uh, p orbitals. You have py and pz on each atom. The orbitals are equivalent to each other and thus two equivalent pi bonding molecular orbitals and two equivalent pi antibonding molecular orbitals will be formed. Now, when you have, for example, a two py overlapping with another 2PY from another atom, you are going to have a side-to-side -side overlap like this. This is uh, this looks like a PZ if that is a Z um, axis. Um, overlapping of one 
PZ orbital with another PZ orbital in constructive manner where you have the same sign, say this is positive, that's positive, that's negative node, that's negative node, you're going to have a bonding pi molecular orbital with, which has a shape like that. But if they have destructive interaction, that is positive, that's negative, that is positive and that's negative, then you have an antibonding molecular orbital where the electron density is outside of the area between the two nuclei. So in here you have the shape of the antibonding pi molecular orbital. So PZ and PZ makes this, PY and PY overlapping side to side also makes this um, uh, pi molecular orbitals. You have bonding and antibonding. The symbol pi is used because pi is the letter P in, in the Greek alphabet and a pi molecular orbital is analogous to an atomic P orbital. So we always talk about atomic orbital and then molecular orbital. They're always analogous to one another. And then we have molecular orbitals that have two nodal pla planes and they are called the delta molecular orbitals. Yeah. In this, in, in your, in the case of, um, say, HM477, we're not going to deal much with delta uh, molecular orbitals, so I'm not going to dwell on that one so much for now. Okay, very quickly, we're going to see what happens. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so you get to see the whole picture. Oh, excuse me, that is too small already. Huh. There you go. Now, if you have, what is this atom? You have one, two, uh, two electrons in the 1s and one electron on the 2s. So what is that um, atom? That is a lithium atom. That is a lithium atom because lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Can you recall? Lithium atom 1s2, 2s1. This is another lithium atom. So when two lithium atoms uh, um, uh, approach one another, yep, they approach one another, they're going to have their orbitals overlapping, atomic orbitals overlapping. The s orbital, 1s orbital with 1s orbital will make sigma 1s and sigma antibonding 1s. That is nothing new there. The 2s orbital will also overlap with the 2s orbital of the two lithium. Now, what do you notice about 1s and 2s? First thing that you notice is that they are exactly the same except for the separation between the bonding and antibonding. These two are located at higher energy levels and the two will have a separation uh, bigger in the second uh, second shell, yeah. So your sigma one s and sigma antibonding one s have smaller separation, but when you have sigma two s and sigma antibonding two s, the separation is slightly bigger. Now let's pay attention to the p orbital. Now when we go into the second shell, you have 1s, you have 2s, and you have 2p. Yeah? You have 2p. When you have 2p, you have 2px, 2py, 2pz of one lithium here, and then similarly with the other lithium, the px and the px can, will overlap because they have the same uh, orientation. If you can imagine, x is in, at, x exists is in that way, for example, that is x, that is probably y on, um, 90 degrees. I don't know if you can imagine this. And then z on the, um, another 90 degrees, uh, axially, axially. So your px and your px will overlap head on. If you look at the orientation of p, x, px they are like that like this uh, go back to uh, I, I hope you can recall when the two px overlap they're going to make sigma 2px and sigma antibonding 2px 
Yeah? Simply because there are two atomic orbitals will make two molecular orbitals. Now, 2PY, which is um, barring in that way, with another 2PY will overlap side to side. They will overlap side to side. Similarly, with 2PZ will also overlap side to side. So two of the P orbitals will overlap side to side on each atom. You're going to have pi 2P Y, pi 2PZ, pi antibonding 2PY, and pi antibonding 2PZ. Yep. So this is how um, elements in the second series of periodic table will have their molecular orbitals when they approach one another. So you have sigma 1s, sigma antibonding 1s, sigma 2s, sigma antibonding 2s, sigma 2px, sigma 2px, pi 2py, pi 2pz, pi antibonding 2py, and pi antibonding 2pz. So that is for lithium. So when we have lithium, three electrons on this lithium, three electrons on that lithium, you have six electrons to deal with in the molecule. So you will fill in the electrons according to Hans rule. You're going to fill in the lower orbital first. So you have filled in the sigma 1s with two electrons, sigma antibonding 1s with two electrons, and sigma 2s with two electrons. Yep. So that is how you will fill in the electrons for homo uh, nuclear diatomic molecule. Homo nuclear means the uh, diatomic molecule. Uh, that means the molecule has two atoms with the same nucleus, lithium with lithium, for example, oxygen with oxygen, for example. But if you have um, oxygen with nitrogen, that is no longer homonuclear, you call that heteronuclear diatomic molecule, but that's le next. So let's have a look at bond order. I, I told you uh, about bond order uh, that will reflect the strength of the bond. Excuse me, this is just too make it smaller so you can see yeah like that yeah now once you know uh, how to put electrons in the molecular orbital that will make it easy for you to calculate the bond order what is a bond order bond order is used to indicate bond strength how strong the bond is, is reflected in the value of the bond order. So the concept of bond order is used. Bond order is the difference between the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons, everything divided by two. So bond order is all of your bonding electrons minus all of your antibonding electrons divided by two. So if we take the case of hydrogen, yeah? Hydrogen, where are you, hydrogen? There you are. You have two bonding electrons. You have zero antibonding electrons. So two minus zero is two divided by two is one. There you are going down here. So for hydrogen, you have two bonding electrons minus zero antibonding electrons divided by two, you get one. Now, one will reflect that the bond between hydrogen atom to another hydrogen atom is a single bond. Yeah, it's a single bond. So the bond order is an indication of bond strength because it reflects the difference between the number of bonding electrons and the number of anti-bonding electrons. A larger bond order indicates a greater bond strength. So, for example, making this smaller so you can see the whole picture. If we have hydrogen, here is your hydrogen just now. Hydrogen, 
2 minus 0 divided by 2 is 1. But if the hydrogen loses an, uh, 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 an electron, it becomes hydrogen plus. So one of the electrons is lost. So you have 1 minus 0 divided by 2 is half. So the bond order of H2 plus is half. That means H2 plus is less... Um, stable than H2. Now let's have a look at helium. Helium has, each one helium has two electrons. If you recall, helium is the second element in the periodic table. It has the atomic configuration of 1s2. Atomic configuration of 1s2. So that means you have four electrons to fill in the sigma 1s and sigma anti-bonding 1s. So you have two bonding molecular, uh, two bonding electrons minus two anti-bonding electrons, which is zero divided by two is zero. So helium has zero, uh, bond order. Yeah, it has zero bond order. And this is very apparent because helium doesn't need to exist as a diatomic molecule because a single helium is stable enough. It doesn't need to make helium two. So this is very, very like unlikely to happen. Helium is a noble gas. It cannot react with another atom. It is stable. The atom is stable enough. All the noble gases will not undergo any reaction. That's why they are very inert. And helium will not make helium-2. This is an indication that it's not going to happen. Zero bond order. Nothing is not going to happen. No bond. But if helium is oxidized to make uh, helium minus, it loses one of the electrons. Why is it? that the electron at the top is lost. Why it is not the electron at the bottom? Because the electron at the top has an unstable position. It has a very, very high energy compared to this one. So if you have a higher energy level electron, if that species needs to lose the electron, it is the one most unstable electron will go out first. It will not go out from the electron at the bottom because this is a very stable position. Just like when you live in a, in a big flat without lift. Uh, uh, people who live on the fourth floor, for example, um, are likely to move out first compared to people who live on the first floor because the people on the fourth floor feel very tired going up the stairs and down, up stairs and down every day. So when they have opportunity, they will go out. But people at the bottom, at the ground floor, will likely to stay put. <laughs> that is just an analogy. analogy yeah? So you have uh, when helium becomes oxidized, one of the electrons will move out from here to make that. So you're going to have 2 minus 1 divided by 2, you have half. So helium 2 plus is a little bit more stable than helium 2. Yeah, The bond order of 0 for helium implies that the molecule is very, very unstable which agrees with the, ob with the observation that helium gas consists of individual hydrogen atom rather than HE2. Yeah? Are you with me? I hope you are. So now that you know how to calculate bond order, we, uh, we can go into a little bit more complicated situation where you have homonuclear diatomic molecule. Now, we have seen uh, just a while ago that I have um, uh, shown you how the atomic orbitals in the second series for element in the second series uh, will make molecular orbitals like this one here, uh, the one that I showed you for this lithium. Yep, this lithium here. We're going to go on to describe the energy level, the energy level. Homonuclear diatomic molecule, they contain atoms of the same elements. 
the atomic orbitals of both atoms are at the same energy level, like you have lithium on the left, lithium on the right, they are exactly at the same energy level, the atomic orbitals. What do I mean by that? I mean like this. The 1s for the lithium on the left is the same energy level, at the same energy level with the 1s at the lithium on the right. Similarly, with the 2s, on the left and the 2s, they are exactly at the same energy level. Similarly with this one, 2px, 2py, 2pz for the lithium on the left is the same as 2px, 2py, 2pz for the lithium on the right. So that's what it meant, this sentence. Atomic orbitals of both atoms are at the same energy level. Now the third, considering only molecules containing the second period elements, yeah, the uh, elements of the second series, the energies of the resultant molecular orbitals are increasing as follows. If you can still recall, sigma 1s is the lowest energy level followed by sigma antibonding 1s, followed by sigma 2s and sigma antibonding 2s. This will be, I think, um, like that. Let's have a look. I don't know whether this is going to... I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try and copy this into here so you can have a look at it easily. Copy this and go bring it up to the page where there is that thing. Yeah. Let's have a look whether I can make this happen for you. Huh. Yeah. There you go, like that. Make it slightly smaller. So you're going to have to squint. Squint a little bit, yeah? Sigma 1s. Sigma antibonding 1s, number 2. Going up the energy level, you have sigma 2s. There you go. Sigma that is made by the overlap of 2 to S orbitals and sigma antibonding to S here, sigma antibonding to S going up a little bit on the energy. You have sigma 2px, there you are. Oh, uh, sigma, no, this is not sigma. You have sigma 2px first. There is something missing here. I'm sorry. Uh, please uh, correct this in your, please correct this in your notes. Something is missing. Sigma 2px. Sigma 2px there. And then you have pi 2py, pi 2pz at the same energy level. Pi 2py, pi 2pz at the same energy level. And you have, oh, um, oh this is reverse order. We follow that first. Sometimes different accord, uh, de de depending on the situation of a certain molecule. Sometimes the sigma is lower than that. You will notice in some textbook that this sigma is higher than this pi, but in some textbook it is like this. It depends on the calculation and it depends on how many electrons there are in there. And then you have the pi antibonding 2py, pi antibonding 2pz, and then lastly you have sigma antibonding 2px. That is the order of the energy level. Yeah, that is what I'm talking about. Going down, ho oh, oh. ho, yep. Now the electrons in the sigma 1s sigma antibonding and so on tend to concentrate along the line between the two nuclei. I'm talking to you. I was telling you about the shape of the sigma. Yeah. <clears throat> the sigma 2px has higher energy. Now, this is if we have all the elements in the second period of periodic table. You have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Yep, these are all the elements in the second series of the periodic table. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So you have, 
uh, for lithium, you have like that. Now, this. This is where I'm saying that the order is reversed. When there is a mixing, oops, undo. When there is a mixing between the S and P orbitals, your sigma uh, 2px will be lower than the pi 2py 2pz. But when there is n when there is mixing, it's like this. When there is no mixing, it is the other way. Yeah. So don't worry. Don't worry about all this. All you have to understand this, we are going to try and see the bond order of this, that, that homonuclear diatomic molecules. Yeah. This is when you have lithium, you are filling in. Uh, notice that in this picture, we don't have the sigma 1s and sigma 2s, uh, sigma antibonding 1s. We don't put that anymore because it is so much in the inner orbital. It doesn't contribute to anything of the bonding of the uh, elements in the second periodic table, the second series of the periodic table. We only take from the sigma 2s and sigma antibonding 2s. Remember there are sigma 1s and sigma antibonding 1s at the bottom, which we do not show. Okay. We have lithium. Yeah. Two of the valence of electrons are put on the sigma 2s. So when we count the, uh, when we count the bond order, you have two minus zero divided by two. You have the bond order of one. For beryllium, you have the bond order of zero. Yeah. So you will not have any BE2 happening. But for boron, you're putting in two more electrons. So these two electrons will occupy, will occupy this in this position now please notice that the order of um sigma 2 py uh, sigma 2 px and pi 2 py pi 2 pz is reversed from what we discussed a minute ago that is because there is an sp mixing sp orbital mixing here just um uh, accept it as it is now because in 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 mathematical terms with there is no sp mixing only that you get this situation happening here is when there is no sp mixing this is below that but when there is sp mixing this will be above that yeah yeah this is above that so when you have additional two electrons to fill in, you're going to put it there. Remember this is following the Hans rule, these two are degenerate. Degenerate means they are at the same energy level. So the two electrons will occupy them singly first. So the bond order is 2, 4 minus 2. Yeah, 4 minus 2 is 2 divided by 2 is 1. Now when you have carbon, you are adding two more, so you are starting to, you're starting to pair the, these two electrons up with two more. So you have, when you try to calculate the bond order, you have, uh, bonding, bonding electrons is two, four, and six. Six minus two is four, four divided by two is two, so you have a double bond between two carbon atoms when you need when you have two two carbon atoms nitrogen on the other hand you are adding uh, two more electrons to fill in into your molecular orbital so nitrogen's last two electrons will go into here so when you uh, try to calculate the bond order it is two four six eight eight minus Two here. This is your antibonding molecular orbital. Eight minus two is six. Six divided by two is three. So you have a bond order of three. What does it? What does bond order of three means? It means that 
the bond between two nitrogen atoms to make a nitrogen gas is a triple bond. A triple bond is a very strong bond. That is why nitrogen gas is very inert. We breathe it in. Seven, more than 70% of the gases that we breathe in is nitrogen, but it does not uh, interact with anything in our body because nitrogen is very inert. Why is it very inert? Because the bond between the two atoms are very, very uh, big. Uh, no, not big, strong. You have uh, a triple bond. But when we come to oxygen, now let's have a look at oxygen. Starting from oxygen onwards, you have sp mixing, sp orbital mixing. So your sigma px is lower than your pi to py and pi to pz. So adding two electrons in there is you are occupying your anti-bonding molecular orbital pi star. When you count the bond order, this is your antibonding, that's your antibonding, the rest is bonding. So that's 8, 6 and 2, 8 minus 4, that is 4 by, divided by 2, 2. So you have a double bond between two oxygen reflected through the bond order. And then fluorine add two more. When you count, you're going to have a single bond between two fluorine. So that is actually the calculation or uh, of bond order um, for homonuclear diatomic molecules in the elements of the second series in the periodic table. Yep. So you have triple bond for nitrogen gas, double bond for oxygen gas, and single bond for fluorine gas. Yep. The general observation that you're going to notice from here is uh, the bond order reflects the bond dissociation energy and the bond length. The stronger the bond, the shorter it is. The weaker the bond, the longer it is. Because a long bond reflects a weak bond. A short bond reflects a strong bond. The bigger the bond order, the higher the bond energy and the shorter the bond length. Molecules with bond order of zero in the case of beryllium and, and diatomic molecules of any noble gases, all the noble gases will have bond order of zero, they are extremely unstable. So you cannot have beryllium-2 happening uh, um, voluntarily in nature. You will not find it in nature. Now, the heavier the molecules, the lower the energies of the molecular orbital. Now, as you can see here, all these energies are coming lower, 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 lower because these are heavier towards the right. So they all become having less and less and less energy as you go from the left to the right of your periodic table. Now, even though B2 and F2 have the same order, bond order, which is 1, B2 has a higher bond energy than F2. F2 has an unusually weak single bond due to larger than usual electron-electron repulsion. Now, this is also taking into account that there are more. This is one. This is bond order of one. Boron also has bond order of one. But the bond between fluorine, when you compare it with boron, boron is a stronger bond compared to fluorine because there are more electron repulsion in fluorine. There are 14 electrons here. They are going to fight over the space among, uh, around the atoms and they're going to have a big repulsion. Yeah? F2 has weak single bond due to the larger than usual electron-electron repulsion. There are 14 valence electrons in the small fluorine molecule. Notice that a nitrogen molecule has a bond order of three, which is a triple bond. It is a very strong bond in uh, nitrogen, 
and that is why this is the principal reason why nitrogen contain, containing compounds are used as high explosives. When you break a triple bond, it's going to be explosive. The reactions involving these explosives give the very stable nitrogen product. So when you break them, they're going to release a lot of energy. Yep. So if you are curious about this, go to the Google and find out why uh, a lot of bombs are made from very, very stable nitrogen gas. So that concludes my lecture for today. It's about 45 minutes. And uh, recall that we have talked about, uh, I'm going to give you a short summary of what we have talked about today. Oh, dear me. This is... First, we talk about how the molecular orbitals are formed when you get a P atomic orbitals. And then we talk about the, this is not isomerism. I'm, I'm going down, down, down into my, to my notes. Excuse me. Ah, there you go. Yep. This is how, uh, what's going to happen when you have, um, P orbitals, uh, P atomic orbitals, um, making molecular orbitals. This is what's going to happen. In terms of bond order, you, you already know how to calculate bond order and then how these or molecular orbitals are arranged in terms of energy and then how you fill them up as you are making uh, homonuclear diatomic molecules like this and comparison between the two and what are the things that we notice when we have homonuclear diatomic molecules. So that's it. Um, I'm going to uh, wrap up my lecture for today here. I hope uh, you will understand this. I'm going to give you more exercise to uh, to make your understanding a little bit more um, stronger. So thank you for now. Uh, see you in our lecture number eight. Okay, bye. Assalamualaikum.